Hi everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Now today I'm speaking with Dr. Matt Slater. Matt, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Hi Dan, thanks for having me. No problem at all, really excited to speak. Why don't we get you introducing yourself to the Sports Psych Show audience? Sure, hi Hi everyone, Um, my name's Matt Slater. Uh, I'm an academic based at Staffordshire University. I'm a senior lecturer in sport and science psychology. Uh, just about to move into an associate professor role in sport and exercise psychology at Staffordshire University, um, and I'm also a, a practitioner consultant in, in the area of sports psychology. Now, exciting times for you, because you've uh, just released a book called uh, Togetherness, How to Build a Winning Team. Um, so, well, tell me, tell me about the, the process of writing this book, mate. How, how come, how, how come you came to uh, writing a book about togetherness? Sure, yeah. It, well, it was a really exciting project, um, and I think it, it came off the back of you know about ten years or so of, of doing research in this area, working with other people, doing research across the globe in this area around teamwork and togetherness, but also the practice I've been doing with sport teams and, and other organisations as well around the importance of team and organisational factors for performance and well-being. Um, and I guess, you know, that if we if we looked on a scale um, and we compared the amount of research and work that's done focusing on individual factors compared to group factors, it would be largely kind of outweighed you know there's so much research and work done which is which is really great and fascinating to read around anxiety confidence motivation to name but three multiple theories within each apart from i suppose as efficacy where spandura's work has kind of held for a long time um, but then we put that on some scales compared to group level dynamics um there's not much there really and and so i kind of i suppose bringing those ideas together thought could I bring together a book that was quite simple, was activity-based for people to go out there and use straight away and also work with the team that brought together the evidence base around togetherness and coupled that with some activities that coaches, that leaders throughout the realms of different areas in life really could go out there and do. So really, there's, I guess, the vision is to have three aspects to the book. The book, first, it it shows the underpinning science of togetherness. It then, secondly, outlines the 3R program, which is the underpinning program to develop togetherness. And then, thirdly, it presents some activities that people can engage with and get out there and start to do. Well, we're going to really hone in on that 3R model. But something you said there uh, uh, actually sparked some interest in my mind. It, it, and, and I agree, there's so much research out there related to the individual within sports, and yet so many sports as we know are team sports. Well, why do you think there hasn't been as much research um, on you know, teamship, togetherness, uh, forming teams? Why do you think that is, Matt? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure I, I kind of really have the answer. I mean, there's some good there's some good models. My thoughts would be there's some good models in sports psychology. Cohesion is a good model. Albert Karen's work, um, which has stood the test of time. Um, but even if you look at the kind of trajectory of that, you know, there's fewer papers being published around cohesion now. Um, his famous meta-analysis in 2002, I think there's about 45 papers included in that, and we're nearly 20 years down the track, and it'd be interesting to see an updated meta-analysis now to see how many more papers there are. Um, so, yeah, that's a good model um, for sure, cohesion is, and some interesting factors that lead to cohesion in terms of task and social cohesion. There's some interesting new new stuff coming out around teamwork and teamwork processes by um, Desmond McEwen, who's now just moved to Bath, and, and some nice work there. Uh, and also collective advocacy, so also to kind, of, kind of team confidence is, a, is an interesting area. So those are the three areas that have got some kind of traction. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure, really. I suppose you start to think about barriers, don't you? Are there other things that stop researchers um, going out there to work with teams? And I suppose, you know, there are added difficulties and challenges with doing team-based research because you 
you, you don't just need to get together a, a few athletes um, from a range of different places. You need to get intact teams uh, to a certain extent. And, and certainly if you're running experiments, for example, you need to run experiments where you create a group of people and you, and you kind of see what happens. So there are some added challenges. They're not insurmountable, though. You know, I think we've found the work in the social identity area. You know, there's lots of work from the social site literature turning and around that and we're kind of bringing that to sport with other people as well across the world who have brought that to sport in the last kind of five years. Um, so, yeah, I think the time is, um, is good. The trajectory is on the up from the social identity point of view. We not long had the International Congress in Sterling um, just about a month ago. People from across the globe came together from Canada, USA, Australia, a group in Queensland, a group at KU Louvre in Belgium, uh, and ourselves coming together to to really start to put social identity and togetherness in sport on the map. Um, and I think it's only going to grow from from here. Interesting, as you say, barriers can be a big problem in terms of... Uh, I find it fascinating because obviously sports coaches, coaches who, who coach teams, will, I would imagine, often say that developing the team, building the team, as you say, team cohesion is so, so important, possibly one of the most important things on their wish list. Uh, and, and yet there's not as much research evidence and, and that's often because those coaches, whilst they believe it's really important, they might put up those barriers in terms of sports sites coming in, studying it. Um, does, does that mean, Matt, I mean, just to, before we get onto the book, does, does, does that mean as a, as a researcher that you take a lot from, say, organisational psychology, from industry, from the corporate world? Because I would imagine there's quite a lot of stuff on team development going on there yeah we do yeah and i think you know i always encourage colleagues and students coming through undergrad postgrad phd to to read wider than the discipline of sport and exercise psychology for sure um, and i try and lead by example on that as well by yeah reading in in general social psychology literature and organizational psychology literature and you know there's, there's a lot of a lot of different models and a lot of different work in that space for sure and i think it's kind of par for the course um which is a bit unfortunate i think i always kind of debate with myself around this that sports psychology compared to some other areas ends up being a little bit behind we kind of jump on the bandwagon and you know if you look at how much research so leadership is kind of intertwined with group dynamics from my perspective yeah. and you know, whilst in sport, the social identity approach is, is pretty new and novel. Um, in general, social site literature, there's, you know, if you stacked every article, printed it out and stacked it um, vertically on a football pitch, you'd be filling a lot of football pitches. You know, there's so many, there's so many papers on it, um, but there's not that same amount and volume and quality in sports like just yet but we are going and the same for transformational leadership you know that's a, a really interesting framework as well and um, it's kind of pretty popular at the moment and has been in sports psych for 10 or 15 years but again you know we're, we're doing minuscule amount of stuff compared to what's out there in the broader literature so yeah if you can get hold of, of literature that's in social psych organizational psych then yeah there's a lot to be learned there in terms of lessons that we can kind of bring to sport but also i'd also say and steve Riker talked about this at the identity social identity conference a fascinating talk and he said don't just think about the fact that you're drawing ideas from organizational psych and social psych you can add to that as well it's a two-way inter it's a two-way conversation there it's a two-way um upstream downstream kind of thing of ideas that we can really add value in that space too um, and I think that's an interesting perspective um, when we think about the discipline of sports psychology and, and how we practice as, as psychologists, you know. Brilliant. Now let's put some more meat on the bone. Let's really dive into this book, Togetherness, How to Build a Winning Team. And you start in Chapter 1, The Science of Togetherness. Um, and, 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 and you start with this subheading of me and us and us and us. Uh, and you've mentioned that term social identity, which we've explored before on the Sports Psych Show, but I absolutely love it. I just think it's so profound, so pertinent. Um, so, so can you talk to us a little bit about the science of togetherness with an emphasis on social identity theory, me and us, us and us? Sure, yeah. So I guess social identity, is come, it comes down to how we view ourselves. 
So, you know, I'm sat here on this podcast with you, Dan. Um, I could be operating within my personality as Matt Slater, the individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have my unique personality, uh, and that's my personal identity. Um, and that's where things like introversion, extroversion, and those sorts of concepts come through. Yep. But equally, myself is multiple, so it's made up of all the social groups that I'm part of as well. Um, and those are the things that are our social identity. So I could be sat here speaking to you um, as an academic uh, or as an author um, or as a sports psychologist um, or as a sports fan. Um, you know, there's loads of different social groups that make up people's self. Uh, and that's the kind of real crux around um, firstly understanding what a social identity is. So it is a social group that has a psychological meaning and significance to us. So it, it's not just any group that we're part of in kind of black and white terms. It has to have psychological value and meaning and connection to you. And, and one of the interesting acti- activities that we do around mapping those a- identities will come on to, I'm sure, is, in- is an interesting process to go through. So I think from a theoretical point of view, that's interesting to just think about because we're talking from a science point of view that to kind of unlock the power of togetherness, we need to work with and create this shared sense of team identity within our sports team or our working department or even our organisation looking more more broadly, more um, at a superordinate level, I guess. So I think that's that's an interesting starting point in terms of understanding the science. Um, ultimately, the goal is about trying to get people to to think about me, yes, and what they can bring to the team, but ultimately put the team first and, and attach their personal goals to a higher meaning and higher identity. So whilst... Yes, I can compete within my sports team and, and get my personal best and score the most goals I ever have ever done um, in this season. What we find when teams are together is that those strikers, those players still put the, the team first. They do what is best for the team first and foremost. Um, and therefore, they are focusing on we and us first uh, and me and them second. So before we put more meat on the bone in terms of how that happens, I mean, from your work, do you, do you find that um, when uh, a team is starting out or an individual comes into a team, by and large, if there's not – that the meaning hasn't been created, the social identity hasn't been fused with the individual identity, do you find that most – competitors in a sport uh, let's say it's it's, it, it's the sport of soccer um, an individual will go into a new team and they are by and large about themselves first and foremost and so what you're saying is the goal of the the, the coach should be to amalgamate their personal identity into the team to create that, that meaning of team um, more salient to the individual yeah, I guess they, they still retain, you know, we still retain our personal identity when we're part of that team. But I think it's about um, taking the team through a process that gives them the opportunity to create uh, what our team is going to be about, what is special about our team. And I think, um, you know, if, if you're ever in a situation where you had a blank canvas and, and you had a new team, that would be fantastic because you've no kind of... Um, things to work from and work with. But actually, we know that real life sport is <clears throat> completely different to that it's much more complex where you know you might go and work with a team and suddenly just brought two or three new players or someone's just left or you do initial work and then some of the team leave and it's it's really fluid and and kind of flexible um so yeah i think that you know the research we've done indicates that the more individuals connect with that team identity the more they feel part of the group uh, and the leader has a key role in kind of creating that sense of togetherness the more they are committed to themselves and the team, uh, the more likely they are to put in effort both kind of on camp and away from camp, for example, uh, the more likely they are to support one another and importantly, um, take support in the way that it's intended from other people as well. And I think that's an interesting aspect, kind of thinking about teams that are together. Um, we're more likely to support one another, but we're also more likely to receive the message in the correct way. Um there's also implications for stress. So one of the one of the experiments we ran here a few years ago um, that we published last year, um, we found that going into a stressful situation or a pressurised situation, so a stressful match, for example, or a semi-final or a final, we could equate that with a similar 
task that we tried to emulate in the lab, we found that when individuals didn't feel a connection with the coach, then they're more likely to, to demonstrate a threat response to that stress or maladaptive response to the to the stressor. And that was in terms of their cardiovascular response. So their body was kind of telling us that as well. So a real objective marker of um, how their body was responding to that stress. You know, so there's there's loads of both individual and team level benefits of togetherness which is borne out through the science in, in social psych and organizational psych and experiments and field work. Um, and now more recently in sport, you know, it is still quite new in sport. And in the book, I talk a little bit about <clears throat> where we're at at the moment. Uh, and I know there's a lot more to come out in the in the coming months and years around togetherness and, and sport and exercise psychology and how important it is. It makes inherent sense to me that um, you talk about stress response, that um, if if I'm focused solely on myself, and I'm only out for myself, all of my goals, all of my objectives are about me, then um, there are going to be times before games, during games, uh, there are going to be times during the season where I might have, uh, might experience quite a strong stress response. Whereas if I can, uh, uh, if I can understand and reflect upon my own individual objectives and see myself as part of a group the capacity to look around in that tunnel or you know, in the changing room or out in the pitch as you're warming up and go this is meaningful to me we're all in this together that that just makes inherent sense to me that you would feel more at ease that you turn down the volume of your stress response mm-hmm. sure yeah and it, it's an interesting point i think and it's that it goes back to that notion that collectively we're, we're greater than the sum of our parts and, 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 and in a lot of aspects. So in terms of our stress response, in terms of our motivation, and uh, I put something out on Twitter the other the other day about recoining the term from um, rather than it being the, the, the famous slogan of you don't know what you are capable of until you try, but let's flip that and say we don't know what we are capable of until we try. You know, I think that that kind of idea that when we are together and we are psychologically connected and we completely trust one another we have each other's backs in that way um and we've all been part of a process where we've developed some shared values and our team identity then that's a that's a great place to be in terms of the team and every team's unique as well i think that's a fascinating point that there is a little bit of research around the all blacks um and there's some great work um legacy by james kerr and the all blacks it's really interesting read it's fantastic and i think fantastic to take some learning points from that but one of the dangers um is that people try and emulate the same thing and, and think that okay well the all blacks had the had the behaviors of sweep the sheds so um so we should sweep the sheds uh, and therefore we'll be successful and i'm oversimplifying it i'm sure that's not how it goes all the time but certainly I've, I've seen a little bit of well they do it that way so we should do it that way as well but that's kind of missing the point and i guess we'll come to this a little bit but the all blacks if you read James James Kerr's book, you realise it's about the Maori culture. Um, there's a lot more to it than 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 just having generic values. They are distinct and special values and behaviours that what it means to be an All Black and, and to be an All Black is different to be a Australian Wallaby or to be part of the English team, for example. And I think that's an interesting kind of conversation to be having as well. Well, I think that's a neat segue to uh, start talking about your three R's. Um, so why don't you just give us a general uh, introduction to these three R's, to tell us what they are, and then we'll take um, each one and, w- and we'll dig a little bit deeper into each one. So why don't you just give us a, 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 a quick introduction to these three R's. So the three R model is a three-phase model. Um, the three stages are reflect, represent, and realize. Uh, and this model was actually put forward first by Alex Haslam, Steve Riker, and Michael Plateau in their 2011 book on identity leadership, which is a really interesting book for people that are interested. Um, um, there's also a second edition of that book coming out relatively soon, I think, as well, um, which might be of interest to some people that are listening. Um, so, so they proposed this book in the final, uh, sorry, this uh, model in the final chapter. And at that point, it was kind of like, you know, here are some ideas. So around the same time, I was reading for my PhD, and that was kind of like my Bible, I guess, for my, for my PhD. And my PhD wasn't particularly applied. It was quite experimental, but I still had some ideas around the three R's. And that led me to start developing some activities 
um, around the three hours. So really the, the three phases are quite heavily interlinked in the sense that you have to go through each stage one at a time. So you can't represent the team's identity, for example, at stage two without first reflecting and understanding what this team is about in the reflecting stage. So there is a sequential approach to the three stages. That said, I also see them um, as general principles in the sense that um, you know you could read the book as a coach and there and then for your next training session pick up a few things that you could kind of go well have I been representing our team in my coaching practice in the last week for example do my team talks involve collective language am I talking about we and us or am I talking about I and they you know and creating psychological distance so so yeah the three phases are are both general principles that you can dip in and out of and, and be mindful of but also a, a process that has to be, be gone through in, a, in that reflect represent and realize so in reflection we're trying to understand what the group's identity is about how do people view this team what are the values that they associate with it serving your apprenticeship and um, i speak a little bit about being a connoisseur of your team which are kind of uh, I kind of borrowed that phrase from from Brett Smith, who I was lucky enough to be taught by him when I was doing my master's at Loughborough. Um, and he talked about, as students, we need to be connoisseurs of research or really understand the research that we're doing. And I, I guess I've borrowed that um, term and said, you know, let's try and be connoisseurs of our team. Just jumping in there, because I just think that's fascinating. I actually wrote that down, um, be a connoisseur of your team. I love that shamelessly steal that Matt and um, mm-hmm. start saying that to the coaches I'm working with and let, let, let's dive in and talk a bit about reflect and and yep. connoisseur well how okay be a connoisseur of your team I'm very excited by that and I know why I am but how how does one become a connoisseur of of one's team I'm, I'm guessing there's a, a bunch of skills soft skills that 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 un, underpin being a connoisseur of the team yeah, there are. And I think um, kind of interpersonal skills coupled with some activities that we need to do to, to really get um, at the root of that. Okay. Um, you know, I think quite often we can we can assume what the team's about um, and, and we assume what people bring to the party and the values that they have. So I think there's some activities to do. Yeah, there's some simple stuff like observing the team. Um, clearly, you're going to be doing that anyway as, as a coach, for example, but both on and off the pitch and, and observing what how people interact and their behaviours, how they communicate. Um, but it's also about you know digging into the history of the team and understanding where this team kind of came from and try and understand... Um, you know why this team was even set up, what the values were then, are we still living the values out now, um, and really serve your apprenticeship so you understand where the team has come from and where it is now. Um, there's a lot of talk of Pep Guardiola doing quite a lot of this as well in terms of delving into the history of Man City and, and how he's using that now in team talks and that sort of thing as well. So there's certainly, there's certainly that, that that comes in. And it's also about, as I say, consciously doing activities with your team to create this. And I know it's always difficult in terms of there's so many things a coach needs to do. There's loads of things on the priority list. And um, what the point here is to try and make this kind of front and centre, make it really important, as well as planning um, sessions, also spend time reflecting with the group and, and doing activities with the group. So some of the activities, are, all the activities involve connections with the rest of the team rather than assuming things and it's going through that process collectively um, that's really important to do rather than assuming perhaps what the values are for example um, and one of the ways one of the ways that we try to set that up is through a senior leadership team um, and I think that's that's an interesting approach to take and I think you know irrespective of what the content of these sessions was I think it's, an, it's a good approach to, to take so you, you set up a senior leadership team and the way that we work generally is that we would do the activities with the senior leadership team which includes some staff and some players um, and then we ask the players to go and do the same activity with the rest of the team which both empowers the rest of the team to be involved and also allows the players to develop their leadership skills because they're creating connections with with other players. And then they feed that back into the the SLT the next time around and the next iteration. So 
we find that that is kind of a win-win situation in the sense that all the team feel empowered and part of the process and that their kind of views are being aired to the rest of the team and, and part of the process going forward but also it develops leadership skills it creates connections straight away and I think the, the other interesting point there around just leadership development if we take a helicopter view on leadership development from a sport point of view from a business point of view quite often what you find is that the leaders in the formal roles so the bosses are, are taken out for a weekend away perhaps for a weekend retreat and they develop their individual skills around kind of confidence, be more resilient, decision making, that sort of stuff, which are clearly important skills um, for those individuals. But the problem there is that we then parachute them back into the team and expect them to be better leaders. Now, what we're saying here is, well, leadership isn't really about those individual qualities and traits. It's about your psychological connection with your team. So leadership development and creating togetherness has to involve activities that involve the leaders doing activities, connecting with um, the rest of their team rather than creating more of a divide. I would argue that leadership development, how it's been done, creates more of a psychological distance and gap between leaders. It drives down togetherness, um, doing quite the opposite to, to what we're proposing in the book, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and, and look, there's so much rich stuff there and just reflecting on what you've said, you know, I going back a couple of minutes, um, I, I, I just I think it's so important for coaches to um, build their capacity to observe um, mm-hmm. around the soft skills, um, you know, listening, uh, observing, um, speaking with players um, about values and aspirations and things and this is what you talk about in the book I just think is so so important I wouldn't want to brush over because I think we are as coaches we're so socialized into the X's and the O's the tech tack physical side that even though maybe verbally we might state the importance of teamship actually the underpinning skills are often forgotten about um for mm. what could be perceived as the more important in inverted commas tech tech physical sides um but what you're mm-hmm. saying in the book is look stop hold on um make sure you're you're taking time in, in this first hour of reflection you're taking time mm-hmm. to observe and 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 draw in information um and then i love also what you say and i'll get you to comment more on that in a second but also what i i I love what you say there is the situated nature the context specific nature of leadership and teamship that going away for the weekend and 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 sitting in a room brainstorming stuff it possibly has its place but it's understanding that teamship leadership happens in the moment, in the context, in the environment, on the training ground, on match day, etc., not 200 miles away in a remote village in Scotland, if you like. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. So, mm-hmm. so I, I, I love some of the stuff you're saying there. Yeah, I think it's some great points there, actually. I think in terms of the observations, it's that kind of idea that um, the actions speak louder than the words there from a coach point of view, that... They have to really turn to the group and turn to the context to really authentically understand what's going on and, and don't kind of see what you want to see and, 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 and overlook some things, but really get an authentic picture of of where people are at. And I think that's really, you know, that's a really important kind of piece of work to do and is, is quite often maybe quite often overlooked. Um, and it reminds me of some of some research around. Um, I talk a little bit about Paul Pogba co- quote in the book, and Paul Pogba did a, a brief speech ahead of the World Cup final to the rest of the French team in 2018. And it, it turns out that he said the word "we" um, really often okay. within that one minute speech. And and so you know the real simple kind of takeaway there which is incorrect, is say the word we more and you're going to win. You know, you're going to be together. It's not just about kind of saying we or, or observing your team, but it's about 
um, what that reflects at a deeper level, the fact that you are really doing things for the team, connecting with the team, means that one byproduct of that is that you say we more because you are truly connected with the team because yourself is is implicated in how well the team does to that extent. So if the team wins and, and loses, you feel it personally, but you feel it kind of collectively as well because of that sense of self, that, that level of connection. And another interesting piece of work Alex Haslam and Nick Steffens did around um, the prime ministers who were vying for election in Australia ever since they gained their independence. And they found that the winners, you know, the ones that went on to win, said the, said the words we and us much more often than the ones that didn't, uh, who tended to say the words I and me a lot more. And again, it's not the simple point that... Um, politicians need to just say we and us all the time, it's that that truly does reflect how they are going about their leadership in a day-to-day manner. It reflects the fact that they are psychologically connected with their team and they want to put the team first in everything um, that they do. So, yeah, I think that's an interesting point. And I think just the other observation I'd make is around stressing the importance of consciously doing these things. Um, And Ian, Ian Mitchell... Um, who's now working with the FA, I think, was working with Chris Coleman um, with the Welsh squad in, in the 2016 Euros, and he talked a lot about some of the work that they did around this um, in terms of creating a team identity, which I think is fascinating because it's quite often overlooked or it's assumed that they'll just naturally come together. Uh, and what, one of the stories I tell in the book is about the, um, the BT Sport interviews, which I think are brilliant, kind of hopefully they happen again um, this year on a on a Saturday evening normally after the game. We had one particular Saturday evening, I remember they had Lampard, Gerard and Ferdinand reflecting with Jake Humphrey about kind of the golden generation and it was kind of I'm not sure they understood where it was going to go until it started happening, but they talked about how they, in simple terms, didn't really come together as an England team. Um, they were still inherently thinking about their clubs when they were kind of on camp and they were still living and breathing for... Manchester United, Chelsea and Liverpool rather than for England and I think perhaps it was assumed that you know let's bring the best footballers together they'll just you know they'll come together that's fine but but actually no we need to spend time together as a group going through activities that start to really connect us and create that trust create that psychological connection and I'd argue it's even more important when you're bringing people together who are rivals to do that thing because you've got people there that are coming together that know that the next weekend they may be competing against each other for the Premier League title, for example. So that it's really important to take the ball by the horns and, and really dive into some of this stuff and, and do it with your team. It's really interesting because it makes me think of a consultancy position I had in the last few years um, where the head coach, it was an international team, and the head coach got the players to bring in their club jerseys uh their Mm -hmm. club shirts with them and and got them to put them the got all the players to meet together and have their club jerseys over the international jersey and Mm -hmm. then he got them a bit of bit of bit of uh, discourse and bit of chatting and then he got them to take off their club jersey so they all had different club jerseys and then they got got them to take them off and suddenly they had this one international jersey on obviously he Mm -hmm. was visually uh, giving a visual representation representation of togetherness, and I think I think the Lampard, Gerard, Ferdinand uh, story you've recounted that is just so fascinating, and I'd urge anybody to go and I think you can get you you can see it on YouTube, Matt. Uh, as you say, it's, a, yeah. it's an interview with Jake Humphrey, and it's just fascinating how we in this country. I don't know if you were like me and got carried away with how good we were, good in inverted commas. Uh, to, was it 15 years ago now? 2006, mm-hmm. 2005 the golden generation as we called it back then and and they were just fantastic players and you know good people and 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 really really articulate um footballers who who were going were going to go and and win um everything do what spain eventually did um but they didn't and and it just shows how we as human beings function emotionally rather than rationally in many respects that we're emotional creatures and the rational thing would be 
you know, well, I'm at a different club to, say, Frank Lampard, or I'm at a different club to Rio Ferdinand, but I can put that aside right now, and I can I can go and compete with him for my country. But the the rivalry was so strong and emotional emotional level that when they came to two international football, they really struggled to put that aside. And maybe at that time, it should have been incumbent on the international staff to help those players have greater togetherness as you say to develop that social identity yeah and i think it's so it's so powerful it comes back to my original point around what is a social identity and how it's it's often overlooked you know we look at an individual and we think well they're an individual person that's their personality and you know they just you know they they function with some groups but it's much more than that The, the groups that we're part of are implicated in ourself you know if we go out and meet someone for the first time or we reconnect with a friend who we haven't seen in years you know you, you go back um, for the summer for example you've not seen them for a couple of years you know you, you tell them about what you've been up to you'll be telling them about your social identities you'll be talking about the groups that you're part of the work you've been doing the voluntary work the sport teams the leisure clubs you know the yoga groups whatever it might be it's all about the groups were part of so that the fact that they have a club identity and it would be really strong is is a real challenge because they're they're paid by the clubs and they're at the clubs for the majority of the time and then we try and bring them together for 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 odd games or odd friendlies and it's really difficult to to bring them together but yeah that that just emphasizes how important it is to to have a plan to develop the togetherness of, of the England international team or any international team that we might be working with Absolutely. Well, let's move on to represent. I mean, that was the reflect uh, part of the model, which, should, you know, just saying to the audience, it's got some great stuff in there with regard activities and helping players uh, discuss who are we, what are our strengths, what's our legacy, etc. So, so there's some great activities in there. The second mm-hmm. part um, is uh, represent. What do you mean by represent, Matt? Yeah, so I guess um, the reflect is about there's a great quote here from, from Alex, Stephen and, and Michael's Identity Leadership book that says it's impossible to lead a group if you don't understand the nature of the group to be led. And so that's what you've kind of ticked off in the reflect stage. You've, you've laid the foundations of the house. Um, it is another way to look at it. And, and that's a really important stage to go through. And I think the reflect stage is probably often the one, if there was any of these stages and things that, isn't done its reflect stage because of time because people tend to jump in there and try and present their vision and value straight away so actually i can't overemphasize how important that reflect stage is and yeah as you say in the book there's some some nice activities you can go through and do that help you to do that and, and representing is ultimately now about embodying the group's values in your in your leadership um so in the reflect stage you start to understand the values of the team and in the represent stage you agree on a shared set of, set of values between three and five values that are going to be important for us that are special and unique to us that tie in our history that everyone's been involved with creating and then you look to okay well how do we define these values what do they look like on a day-to-day basis in terms of our behaviors um and Again, through an SLT kind of approach, we tend to lead these activities with the senior leadership team and then we go and ask the players to go and do the same activity in their own time with the rest of the group so that we can get some some good content from them as well and get them empowered and involved. And then they, in an iterative way, come back to the group. And we agree, you know, we agree, you arrive at a, a shared set of values that are going to be important to us. And and then work on some behaviours that we can, you know, to some extent be held accountable to and also feed into how we're going to reflect and move forward as a team. But ultimately, our collective collective values and behaviours that we're going to move forward with. And I think we take Barcelona as an, as an example. It's interesting. On their, on their website, they have a page dedicated to this, you know, and I'm not sure there's many other international sport teams that, do the same but there's a specific page dedicated to the Barcelona identity they have five values you know the five values um spell wreath um I'm not sure they meant to spell wreath but they spell wreath you know effort ambition teamwork and humility those are the five values that are at the core of of Barcelona uh, and the associated behaviors kind of come through that as well so so yeah representing is about now agreeing on the set of values associated behaviors 
and also then thinking about you know the vision of the of the team and that kind of brings together the the vbv jigsaw we talk about vision behaviors and values that that we we can really move forward with and make progress yeah and and i i i I, in my own work find those behaviors to be so so important because that uh, i think makes it realistic for for coaches and players you know it makes it tangible um here are the behaviors we want to engage in um i suppose my question to you is in your work um how are there things that you do are there conversations you have that uh help players help coaches um stick to those behaviors that uh, because there's one thing doing this stuff it's another mm-hmm. it's it's another thing then going a- and acting it out and i suppose maybe i'm moving on to the realization part here which is the third mm-hmm. r but um mm-hmm. when you work with teams when you work with coaches and players um how are you helping them to adhere um to these behaviors mm-hmm. sure yeah it, it's a um it's a good challenge that i think because um, I think on the one hand, we find because there has been a collective approach to the process from the get-go, mm. um, both in terms of creating a senior leadership group and also going through the reflect stage, um, which in practice is going to take a number of weeks, could take a bit longer, but obviously that depends on context and things that's going on. I think on the one hand, we get um, we get good buy-in you know, for these behaviours. We get, you know, drawing on self-determination theory, people feel autonomy because they've been involved in the process from the start. So I think on the one hand, um, the buying I've found has has been good. Yeah, it's it's certainly been good compared to an approach where you kind of go in in a top-down way and kind of go, here are the values that you're going to embody. And people kind of go, oh, hang on a minute, where did those come from, you know? Um, so on the one hand, that happens. But yeah, I think the senior leadership kind of team approach is important there um, because I think the crucial thing is that you develop the confidence with the players and the staff in the initial work that you do, that they, they've gone through the activity themselves. And then it's really crucial that they go out then and go and do that with the rest of the team and then feed in. You know, And you know, often people kind of question me and say, well, what, can you not just go and do it with the team? Uh, of course I could, you know, of course I could go and do that. And sometimes I might um, go along to just be there in the session, but most of the time I don't. I really want the players to go and do do this on their own. So there's certainly a conversation to be had there with the players to make sure that they feel confident enough. Usually they do because we've been through the process with them, um, but also to encourage them that it's really important that they do go and connect with the rest of the team to to do this because we all know what teams are like we all know that there's certain characters that maybe you know, are more difficult to handle for example and, and someone you know might not be happy about having to go and deliver a session to them you know so certainly some kind of confidence building supporting and, and motivation kind of work you have to do to have a conversation to help the players but just to reiterate the importance of that collective approach um, and I think the fact that they're part of the SLT you know, gives them confidence that they've kind of been identified as a leader, I guess, but equally the fact that you've taken them through the process first means that they can then go out and and do that. Um, I think another important conversation to be having um, maybe a little earlier, mm. actually, rather than now, is to the coaching staff is around the time needed to invest in this sort of stuff and, and the reflect phase in particular that, um, you know, I've recount a few coaches asking me you know when are we going to see some differences Matt but when are the behaviors going to change you know um and and that's and that's a completely justified question because um you know we have to be accountable for the work that that we are doing um and I think I was guilty of of not having that conversation to start with because I you know I, I have it in my mind how it's going to work but clearly I hadn't articulated it as well as I could to the coach and, and how long it takes. So I think having having those conversations with the staff are, are important as well. Um, and also being able to encourage the staff. So you may have a, a couple of members of staff that are part of the SLT, but can you also engage the staff? And this is quite difficult to do. Can you engage the staff to go and connect, just as we ask the players to go and connect from the SLT to the rest of the players? Can you ask the staff to do the same thing? 
And, and I think that's a really interesting piece of work. If you can get the staff, you know, two or three members that are part of the SLT, can you go and run a session now with the wider group, the medicine staff, for example, and, and the different specialist coaches that are not part of the SLT, can you go and engage with them and, and bring some information back? Because the more people we can have on board, the better in terms of um, getting everyone to buy into this piece of work that we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, as you're speaking there, uh, what I'm hearing is the importance of player autonomy and uh, also, I suppose, delegation as well. You know, as you you mentioned at the end there, um, bringing in other members of staff and potentially delegating some things to them. Um, But that player autonomy, self-determination theory, if you like... um, the involvement of the players is so important and, and actually I think you've got uh, a couple of paragraphs about this in the book I'm just looking at it now uh, from a, I assume it's a researcher uh, called Don Van Nippenberg if I'm getting oh, yeah. that, that name right and he yeah. and, and he's essentially saying that uh, lead, leadership for me and my plans will not create togetherness but leadership mm-hmm. for us and our plans will and a general theme I suppose that's been running through things for the last 40 minutes has very much been this notion of you know togetherness does rely or is heavily mediated by effective leadership and when that leadership is arguably too top down that is going to impact the ability to develop togetherness whereas if that leadership is a bit more autonomous or autonomy supportive Mm -hmm. i should say and promoting bottom-up solutions in the form of values and behaviors then we have more chance of building togetherness and executing that plan sure and th- those values and behaviors are, are now part of my identity i guess you imagine yourself as an athlete as part of part of this team then um, i'm connected to this team and what it means to be part of this team for barcelona's example is to show respect effort ambition teamwork hum- and humility and that that is what i do on a day-to-day be- basis that's what i live and breathe when i'm a barcelona player that is my identity you know that that identity and those values are unique to us and we've been involved in creating them together which means I'm, I'm there in the here and now and I'm present with it now when I go home to my family um, I'm suddenly my identity changes I'm a husband or I'm a dad um, or whatever it might be and suddenly the values and behaviours are different and, and another example of how those different social identities can can play out but it means that when we're in the here and now and we are connected to Barcelona, these are the things that are really important and these are what I'm going to be expected to demonstrate, equally judged on and held accountable to. And those are the things that kind of develop trust. You know, um, I remember Simon Sinek talking in one of his TED Talks quite interestingly around trust and the idea that you can't, it's really interesting, intangible, you can't just say some, to someone, trust me, and they will, you know, it's all about your action, isn't it? And and this really comes back down to representing the group for me, that the coaches that are most trusted are the ones that do it for us, so they make the decisions for the group, they don't make them, or versus making the decision for themselves, and where they might get some personal gain, so that, that trust is only developed through through actions it's not something that you can just say to someone and they you know they trust you you've got to demonstrate it by by leading in a way as you say that is representing the group and representing our values and behaviors and i think that's that's an important piece of work and and also that leadership aspects i mean it's a whole other conversation i suppose but katrine franson's work in louvre and she's done some really nice research and practice around a shared leadership model and i think we're seeing a bit of a move in modern day sport kind of towards this you know so away from the vertical top-down structure and this is kind of where the book and togetherness fits in as well but away from the vertical top-down structure and a move more towards a shared leadership approach where it's not just about the formal leaders but it's about any person that demonstrates leadership and i would argue leadership is in the here and now you will have been through leadership today, whether you've realized it or not. You will have tried to influence somebody or you will have been influenced by somebody. And that in, in itself is leadership. It's about influencing other, other people. So the idea that Katrine's work shows that quite often the leaders that are the formal leaders or the captains formally are not the ones that the players demonstrate or say demonstrate the best leadership on the team. 
it's a fascinating study where she found 1% of the time, I think it was, that the, the captain fulfilled the four athlete leadership roles. So that demonstrates that leader, leadership isn't just about the coach or the captain, it's a shared endeavor. And if we can embrace that, then we can maximize the benefits of, of that kind of shared leadership approach. And that's not, that's not a kind of a new approach, really. Sheriff and Sheriff's original stuff from the 60s, you know, Robbers Cave experiments, you know, they, they found the team that won were the ones. If you look at the network, it was a flat network where it was all interconnected it, it versus the team that lost, which is more hierarchical, you know, where there was one person at the top, one person underneath, and then, you know, divided in tiers. Those are the teams that, that didn't do so well. The winning teams were the ones that were more connected, more shared leadership, less hierarchical. And I think that's a, certainly a space where we're moving to. There's a, there's a couple of examples I remember from last year. I think Brentford... In the, in the championship, for example, talked about having multiple captains. I think GB Hockey have done that before. There was an interesting article from Pep Guardiola on the BBC earlier this year talking about how he was going to ask the players who he wanted to be captain rather than him um, you know, just picking who the captain's going to be. So there's lots of interesting um, shifts, I think, going on more towards a togetherness, autonomy-driven approach in terms of coaching. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you, I think you've also got a famous example um, from a guy called Rick Charlesworth, the Australian hockey ruse, very successful, won multiple medal, gold medals uh, with the um, women's Australian hockey team uh, and, and how he had um, different leadership groups um, doing different things, so a, a social leadership group. Um, just uh, leadership across different activities so yeah. interesting and, and and look what i hear you say just moving on to that third aisle but what i what i hear you say matt is you know that reflection piece who are we is very much the foundation and then maybe the structure here is that autonomy supportive piece as a leader i'm helping my players come up with the values and the behaviors so there's more chance of them living those values living those behaviors and i'm guessing to to kind of furnish our house if you like uh this last piece is little ways to further live them um to bring them to life essentially so you you Mm -hmm. talk about uh motivational montages and infographs and cue cards and things like that why don't you, you tell us a little bit about those little techniques and ideas to further bring this to life so, yeah, I think this is the interesting element. I think you touched on this earlier, Dan, where you said quite often the, these pieces of work, very enthusiastic exci- and enth- excited at the start, and, and, and quite often they can um, fall by the wayside. Other things become more important, or we get a little bit down the track and we start to disconnect with the values, and it's not really um, on the hymn sheet to continue to reflect on each day. And in the end, they can drop off. Um, the cliff. So I think this realizing phase is, is really important to maintain um, the great work that we've been doing and, and also evolve it as well. You know, these values are values that we've generated, but they're also fluid and they evolve. So there's a, there's a continuous kind of process here to be, um, you know, to be had. Um, but yeah, I mean, a few few kind of ideas around realizing what we're trying to do there is implement um, activities, plan events do things with the team that allow us to live out our values. Now, they may be performance-related. They may be about being the most supportive team, for example. So what things could we do that allow us to live out our values and continue to evolve those values? And that's where the context nature of what, we, what we've done is really important. So, for example, if the, one of the key values is about being the most supportive team that we can be, then you might think about... Um, putting together some support champions or identifying some people within the team who are going to really drive that piece of work around being the most supportive team that we can be and you give them a leadership kind of responsibility to do that for example um the slt kind of continues but it becomes more kind of fluid and driven by the leaders and the coaches rather than um, kind of me driving the agenda for them for the slt is it tend, tends to be how it continues for me so that the slt continues in terms of its structure and how it works. I work with them and then they work with the rest of the group, but it's more driven by them rather than me now in this phase. So I think that comes through. Um, yeah, little tips around, you know, some of the pieces of work we did with the Paralympic squad 
when we're working alongside Jamie Barker, he was working with the analyst and he was able to to clip up the games and training to demonstrate here's us doing these values and behaviours really well versus um, when we didn't do it so well and put that over some music and use that at important points within the tournament in the World Cup and also um, at the Rio Paralympic Games. So I think some tangible things working with the group to do that. Also working with, and this will come through organically, I tend to find it comes through organically, working with the coach to think about the language that they're using and are they using the language of the of the values. And this comes organically typically because the coach will just kind of do it in their team talks and after games, but that's certainly, you know, used a piece of work to do there. There's little reminders and cues, yeah, infographics we can create of our of our values and send it to the players and they're, they're little nudges. We're not saying that's going to transform someone's world, but it is a, a little reminder of, of what we're about, perhaps. Um, and also, you know, whilst this is a, a really supportive, autonomy-driven approach, um, it's not completely democratic because you you can you can and should be holding your players accountable to the values that they've de- that they've come up with. So sometimes, you know, you have to reflect and go. Last week in that game, did we demonstrate the values and behaviours? You know, maybe there is there is a place and there is a place to be automatic. And and ultimately, if you're a coach that fully understands your group and your context, sometimes you don't need to be democratic because you know the answer because you're doing it for the group. You don't need to go to the group to ask their permission to do it. You can just do it. But the, the test there is that you truly and authentically do understand what is best for your group and, and this context, you know. So I think that's an interesting um, kind of piece as well and then you're kind of monitoring things towards the vision which you would have created in an earlier phase are we making progress towards that um, so yeah some really quite tangible things that you can start to do I think at this place but it is important to identify where the bumps in the road might be and, and have an action plan so think about the barriers that might stop us living out our values and then also you know an action plan to overcome them is it is the bottom piece of work to which the end of the book you talk about barriers um, mm. and and in my experience certainly one of the barriers to togetherness that I, um, I've come across time and again day after day actually especially in the world of soccer and I'm talking about at the adult elite level here especially uh, but it, as well in the developing elite um, is every player wants to play if you've got a squad of 25 players, every player wants to play. Uh, mm. Because ultimately, most, the vast majority are focused on their career. And we've talked about the, the me versus the we. Um, mm. But um, people want to leave a legacy. They want to play. They want to play week in, week out. They, they love to play soccer. Or they love to play basketball. Or they love to play um, baseball. And they want to be in that starting lineup. Mm. And my conversations with managers or head coaches often revolve around that. Well, they'll say, well, Dan, how do I help it? Because they're often the most destructive players. And a lot of head coaches and managers will say, I understand why they're angry, frustrated. I understand. But ultimately, I can only pick so many players. That strikes me as one of the barriers we have here in terms of mm-hmm. building togetherness. I mean, is that your experience as well? And are there other barriers that you've come across? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point, and it certainly is a it certainly is a challenge, um, and it, and it and it does take some thinking about. And I think it's a, it's a good, although it is a barrier, it's a good place to be in the sense that that, that demonstrates that that person is willing and motivated to be here, and they and they want to play. You know, I think what's worse is someone who completely disengages, mm. and. Um, it's a bit like when you're going through change, the people that kind of stay quiet and don't do anything are typically the ones that are probably the worst versus the people that are voicing their opinion and saying this might not work, this not, might not work, because that demonstrates that they do connect with with this group and are, are concerned about where it's going and if, if things are going to go well or not. Um, so, yeah, a few thoughts, I suppose, on that would be... I remember reading a story about the British Lions and how they had a... You know, they have a similar situation as we do in all sport teams where they have a number of shirts to be filled, but they take a touring group of double that or a little bit more. Um, and, and they work to a situation whereby 
And this, you know, takes some work and some strong conversations, perhaps, whereby if you weren't picked, then your job was to make sure the person that was picked in your shirt was going to have their best game. And that's a really interesting concept, I think, and maybe one that's quite unique to an international um, situation, I think. But, you know, giving them some leadership responsibility to to actually say, no, OK, you, you haven't been picked, but your role now is to make sure the person has been picked at number seven. They've got everything they need to excel when we go and play as a team and if you've created a situation where we have a strong team identity and the group is put first then that person would understand that if the decision has been made in a in the right way you know we, there's lots of examples of of athletes for example um the canadian ice skater i remember he got picked for for the Winter Olympics and said, no, I'm not going to go. Um, I, I want my friend to go instead. You know, people do self-sacrifice, surprisingly, more than we think. That's um, extraordinary altruism, isn't it? That, that's, yeah. that's a rarity. But, yep, yep, it, absolutely, yeah, it does uh, happen. But, you still, but you're right. You still, get, you still get the people that are all about me. If, they are, if they're problematic and disruptive, like you say, then, then you do get to a point where you have to think about... Um, what are they bringing to the party in terms of their value and do we need to move them on, for example, depending on what level we're talking about. But the All Blacks will be really clear on this and I'm not saying we all should do this because the All Blacks do it, but it's an interesting um, point to consider um, that if there's someone in the team, doesn't matter how good they are, if they're disruptive to the team, um, then they're not in the team. They're out. They're, they're taken away from the environment, you know, and... I think that's an interesting thing to you know to consider as well, and I don't think there's um well there isn't kind of one single correct answer to this, but it's about kind of understanding the context and I think certainly this approach where you're involving all the players and trying to develop a, a core identity as a, as a squad and as a team and managing the conversations on a simplistic level in terms of when that player is going to be needed because they might not be picked now, but they are going to be needed for sure down the track in the in a squad perspective. Simple things like having those conversations are clearly important as well. And, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, for example, has always talked about as being someone who's very good at managing that sort of thing. You know, you're not playing this week, Wayne, but, you know, you really need you for the Champions League, for example, and X, Y and Z. And people felt, OK, yeah, pretty special, even though they weren't playing. He probably had a way about him to be able to, to create that. But also the most extreme thing of, you know, if this person is being too problematic for the team, then... Yeah, maybe maybe they're not right for the team, and we need to move them on. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Matt, you finished the book on a quote, uh, a, a Vince Lombardi quote. Which, yeah, no less. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, the, the the classic Lombardi quote, um, yeah. and that is this: It's it, Lombardi said, "The challenge of every team is to build a feeling of oneness, of dependence on one another." Because the question is usually not how well each person performs, but how well they work together. So my final question for you, Matt, is of all the things that we've said, you know, you've got an audience tuning in who are are probably predominantly coaches. What's the one big piece of advice that uh, main piece of advice? I know there's loads and we've talked about loads. It's been brilliant. Uh, What's what's. What for you is the most pertinent piece of advice on developing togetherness for coaches who I suppose coach at just about all uh, ages and 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 uh, are functioning at all levels of the game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Um, I think on the understanding that creating a unique team identity that is about our shared values is really crucial to developing togetherness and, and that has to be unique to us and, and kind of understand understanding that we can't we can't kind of copy or mimic um any other sport teams but engaging in conversations having activities where you work with your team to really get at what are our values behaviors and vision going to be as a team and where are we going uh, yeah that would be the one the one key driver, I think, to developing togetherness. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. 
Now, Matt, how can um, well look? How can people get hold of this book? It's it's called Togetherness: How to Build a Winning Team. How can people get hold of the book? And how can people engage with your your work in general? How can they find you? Are you on social media, etc.? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I think um, it'd be great to carry on conversations with people if if they if they want to for sure. You can get the book on Amazon. Um, um, it, just Google it, and then you'll be able to find it, no problem. And I am on social media, yeah, on Twitter, um, at Dr. Matt Slater. It'd be good to carry on the conversation. And also, there's an Instagram page um, for the book and project as well, Togetherness, two underscores, project, Instagram page there as well. So, yeah, it'd be great to see what people think of the ideas and how they land and, and carry on the conversation. Brilliant. Well, uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, everyone, that was Dr. Matt Slater um, talking about ooh, the the science and art of developing uh, a team, uh, his book, Togetherness, How to Build a, a Winning Team. Uh, and it's just a fantastic book um, full of uh, mini stories, examples, and, and lots of practical uh, ideas and techniques, and all backed up by scientific research as well, which I think is important. Um, Well, I really did enjoy that podcast, and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, thinks. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, and tell me exactly what you think of the Sports Psych Show, and if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm really looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.